The United States Radium Corporation was located at High and Alden Streets in Orange, New Jersey between 1917 and 1926. Young working class women were hired to paint the luminous dials for wristwatches using a formula specially developed by company founder and physicist Dr. Sabin von Soshoki. Little did the workers know that the formula contained a dangerous element called radium that crippled and killed those who ingested it and inhaled it. The plant in Orange, New Jersey was built to factory law standards and offered ideal working conditions. An average worker earned $20 a week painting 250 watches a day. The women enjoyed their work and applied radium to their fingernails and eyelids. At the end of the day, the women were covered with luminous powder so their clothes and hair shone in the dark. They were unaware that they were digging their own graves. How did the women ingest the radium? First, the dial painters mixed the dry luminous paint powder with paste and thinner. Next, they used their lips to carefully point a small brush and dipped it in the paint. Then, they filled in the numbers and lines on the watch face so that it would glow. Dial painters were actually told that exposure to radium was good for their health. Just once did someone at Orange suggest a problem. Bonso Shoki warned dial painter Grace Fryer that putting a paintbrush in her mouth might make her sick. When another dial painter, Catherine Schaub, confronted Von Soshoki, he told her it was not hazardous. Nevertheless, precautions were taken in some parts of the plant. Florence Wall, an assistant to Von Soshoki, wore protective clothing. Catherine Schaub was the first worker to connect the job at U.S. Radium with her illness. She worked at the plant for three years when she consulted a doctor. At that time, radium was not a known industry health hazard. Soon after, Catherine Schaub's cousin, Irene Rudolph began having trouble with her mouth. She went to see her dentist, Dr. James Davison, who removed the tooth. The hole never healed. Instead, it became red, sore, and began to swell. Dr. Davison removed more teeth and, and the rotting bone. Dial painters Amelia Magia began suffering from tooth problems in 1922. Her entire mandible had to be removed. An autopsy in 1922 found evidence of radium in her bones. Her doctor reported the death to a Newark health official and then the State Department of Labor. An official visited the orange plant twice but could not find any violations of factory laws. New Jersey Health and Labor Department sent chemist Dr. Samuel Towski to the plant. He suggested that radium could be a cause of the dial painter's problems. As you know, radium has a very violent action on the skin and it is my belief that the serious condition of the jaw has been caused by the influence of radium. Yet, the state labor department took no action. Other women began showing serious symptoms including Hazel Vincent Couser. Her upper jaw was removed and required blood infusions. Helen Quinlan suffered with sore throat, swollen face, aching teeth, and sore gums. Marguerite Carlyle's face swelled, her molars and jaw bones were removed. She was diagnosed with necrosis of the jaw. Catherine Schaub's oral surgeon, Dr. Walter Berry, was convinced that the industrial disease was the cause of the problem. He said her teeth were radioactive. While more women were experiencing the effects of radium, Lenore Young of the Department of Labor discovered a report entitled Preliminary Note on Observations made on physical condition of persons engaged in measuring radium preparations that stated despite the medical findings, no serious effect had been found. January 1924, the vice president of U.S. Radium wrote in the insurance company stating that they do not recognize that there is any hazard in the occupation. New Jersey Labor and Health Department took no action against the orange plant through 1924. March 1924, Lenore Young contacted Catherine Wiley, the Executive Secretary of New Jersey Consumers League. The Consumers League was a voluntary society dedicated to improving workers' conditions. This period of history saw the rise of reformers like Catherine Wiley, who became the champion of radium poisoning. Her goal was to recognize the disease, pay the victims, and prevent future cases. Wiley sought the help of toxicologist Alice Hamilton and others to prove that radium was a health hazard. Mm -hmm. The task was not easy. Wiley contacted Hazel Vizicuser's dentist, Dr. Theodore Blum, who said U.S. Radium was responsible. Yet, he also told U.S. Radium that he would treat Kuser secretly and protect the company from liability. Dr. Andrew McBride, Commissioner of New Jersey Department of Labor, told Wiley there was no connection between the dial painter's work and their illness. U.S. Radium wrote to Wiley and said that the woman's illness lies outside of our plant, indicating that this is not an occupational disease. 
Meanwhile, Harvard group consisting of Cecil Drinker, Dr. Catherine Drinker, and Dr. William Castle toured the plant and found that inhaled radium caused jaw rot. June 1924, Cecil Drinker told U.S. Radium his findings. Arthur Roeder, U.S. Radium president, objected and concluded, There is nothing harmful anywhere in the works. Frederick Flynn, a representative of U.S. Radium, told Catherine Schaub the radium was not the cause of her illness. Flynn told the dial painter, Grace Fryer, that she was healthy. Wiley did not give up. With the conclusions of the Harvard study, the New Jersey Commission of Labor told U.S. Radium that it must institute safety procedures or close. U.S. Radium left Orange. In the summer of 1925, Catherine Schaub consulted medical examiner of Essex County, Dr. Harrison Martland. Martland examined dial painter Sarah Maleffer and found radioactive substances in her spleen, liver, and bones. Sarah was very ill. She suffered necrosis of the jawbone. Most of her teeth were missing. Her lower jawbone was fractured and her palate eroded so that her nasal passages could be seen. Dr. Martland examined Catherine Schaub and tests found that she was radioactive. He believed that lip pointing was responsible because the radium would find its way to the bones. Dr. Martland's work was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. U.S. Radium said there were no cases outside of Orange, New Jersey. Later, Dr. Martland published a paper in the American Journal of Cancer where he said any exposure to radiation might be dangerous and suggested a zero-tolerance policy permitting absolutely no exposure to a dangerous physical or chemical agent. May 1927, dial painters Grace Fryer, Catherine Shaw, Quinta McDonald, Albina Lloris, and Edna Hussman filed suit with the New Jersey Supreme Court. The lawyer planned to argue that U.S. Radium had a duty to know the dangers of radium and a duty to warn their employees of the danger. In an out-of-court settlement, each woman received $10,000 and $10 weekly. They also covered their medical expenses. The dial painters knew that their illnesses were related to the job, even if they couldn't put a name on it. They fought along the Consumers League to win recognition of their disease, compensation from U.S. Radium, and measures to protect future cases. The Consumers League helped the women receive monetary awards. They pressured the state labor commissioners to forbid U.S. radium to continue painting dials in the state. The Consumers League also pushed the radium necrosis bill and suggested safe practices for producing luminous watches. The League's work improved health and safety in the workplace. Lots of publicity surrounded the case of the radium girls. The New York Girl covered the story and labeled this case an example of Jersey justice at its worst. Catherine Schaub stated in a 1928 newspaper article, While other girls are going to dances and the theater and courting and marrying for love, I have to remain here and watch painful death approach. The tragedy was definitely a turning point and had a great historical impact. The right of individual workers to sue for damages from corporations due to labor abuse was established as a result of the Radium Girls case. Industrial safety standards was increased and the case led to passage of Congressional Bill in 1949, making occupational diseases deserving of compensation and extended the time during which workers could discover illnesses and make a claim. In 1958, the New Jersey Consumers League helped pass legislation to control radioactive substances in the state. In 1991, the New Jersey Supreme Court found that U.S. radium was forever liable for a radium at the orange site.